morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's kind of cool to see you all. I missed you. Uh, and you're like, were you gone? Um, so I was at the UCC General Synod last week, and I will write about that for Woodside World. Some of you know that Woodside initiated a resolution against bigotry that went before the Synod through multiple processes prior to um, Synod and ultimately was tabled. So it's a very radical thing to be against bigotry in the church. Um, and we need at least two more years to think about it. So uh, I know I was as, as stunned as you. Um, I actually did not, I'll, to be honest with you, and I've said this before, I actually did not expect it to pass because it was about bigotry against LGBTQ folk. And it is still kind of popular to be against the LGBTQ community in terms of civil rights, in terms of you know Thanksgiving dinner, in terms of most things. So I, I really did not expect it to pass. Um, and then I told you they, they threw it into a category requiring two-thirds instead of simple majority, which further um, killed its chances. I did not expect it to be tabled. Folks did everything they could not to have to have the conversation. And I will write more about that in Woodside World. It's been a week since, since this, and I'm still kind of pissed off. So. I will write more about it in Woodside World for you, all of the various ways that the process was created to keep this from becoming a conversation, much less an action that passed. It was just maddening to experience. So, um, but here I am, um, um, back from, back from, <laughs> And, and every step of the way, every step of the way, I thought to myself, what a gift to be in a congregation like Woodside, where, where the conversation was raised, the question was asked and answered, and it didn't take a whole lot of, um, you don't table being against bigotry here, and I appreciate that. So, um, there you go. Some other important things at General Synod, but I can't remember what they were. Um, I am very excited today to introduce you to our guest preacher, who is David Gregg. He is the new executive minister for the American Baptist Churches of Metro Chicago, which is the region to which we belong since Michigan region threw us out some years ago for see bigotry above. Um, so there's a, there's a theme in our, in our announcements this morning. Um, David, is, um, David is a trailblazer, and Chicago region is a trailblazer. Um, David is the, I'm gonna out you right now. That's not, that's not surprise. David is the first um, openly gay executive minister of any region in the American Baptist churches, and we chose him right here in the Chicago region. So we are. David was also very helpful to me last year when I was going through the process of seeking and being afforded Baptist credentials. And so I'm very appreciative of that as well. David is a, a friend and a colleague, and I am just so pleased that he could be here with us today. Um, let's see, what else? Um, thanks to the people that helped move the offices. Why didn't you unpack them? <laughs> Um, no, I'm teasing, really. Um, but there is a growing um, pyre of boxes upstairs that's starting to look like our insurance agent might have a word about it. 
Um, so if you're inclined to help remove boxes or empty boxes, that'd be great. But, but I really appreciate all the folks that have done so much to get us into this space. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I also see that our art wall has, has um, taken on its first gallery showing. The photos that you see there were taken um, last year at Court Street, I mean, year before last at Court Street, and also um, back in December during our trial run here, they were taken by Chris Sumowitz, and we really appreciate his sharing those with us. Um, and, and thank you very much to uh, Bill Angus, who created the gallery infrastructure and got them on the wall for us and to Linda Angus, who no doubt was overseer of the entire project. <laughs> so, so thank you all for that. Uh, we will see, I hope that we will see regularly the exhibits on that wall change to reflect community interests, um, various kinds of provocative art, um, maybe the history of this building, if we can be in collaboration with um, Sloan Museum or the Buick Gallery. So, so you just never know what's going to show up there. If you have ideas, then uh, talk to Linda, because she's the new chair of the Art Wall Committee. So <laughs> she did not know I was going to say that this morning. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's lovely to be able to see that and to know, you know, to see faces of, of uh, people that we've known and loved and people that we gather with and people that we miss. So. Uh, so please take a minute as you're having refreshments to enjoy that. Um, <coughs> usually this is the time just for announcements about worship. Did I say any of those yet? Um, I don't think there are anything special, any uh, things special that we need to know about this worship, except that um, we prefer if we could all begin and end at the same time. Other than that, let the spirit move you. Move you. Um, we're going to have communion. We do that every week. If you're new here, I'll just tell you that. And we also invite anybody that wants to to come to the table. A lot of congregations have membership requirements or age requirements or theology test requirements or, you know, ID or whatever. We don't do any of that. So just if you are hungry for the grace of God, you should come and eat. That's, that's our entire standard here. Um, the bread is gluten-free, the wine is alcohol-free, and you're welcome to come and take bread and dip it in the cup and then go back to your seat at, at the appropriate moment, not right now. Um, and so we'll get to that. And is there any musical stuff we need to be aware of this morning? Um, the final song is a new Look, song. Look, we have a piano! Yeah! <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> the final song is a new song, and so the singers and myself will sing the first verse through. To familiarize, I love this song. To familiarize everyone with it, and then I'll announce it when we get there. But okay, that's really the only thing. Can we sing the refrain right now? I really love this song. <laughs> that one, the refrain. Yeah, Did you say the refrain? refrain? Okay. Yeah. All right, last last two pages, everybody. Are you there? Even the stones will cry out. Even the stones will cry out for justice. Even the trees will sing out for peace. The fire and the earth and sky all creation will cry out. All of creation will sing. What a lovely song. Okay, we'll look forward to that. Um, so that's, that's worship, and we're thankful to readers and ushers and greeters and, and food bearers and everybody else that gets us through this time, so thank you. We say every week, and, and we try to sound sincere because we really mean it, whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome at Woodside Church. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. This is the house of God. This is the house of love. This is the house of justice. This is the house of welcome. Let this house ring out with voices of praise and shouts of desire. So even our worship may reflect the righteous reign of God. Come, let's worship. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you have made this a house of prayer for all people 
and called us to your vision of equity and love. Be in us and work through us that the world may learn to breathe again. Amen. Please remain standing. Let's sing together our first hymn, Let Us Enter In. Let us enter into the song of thanksgiving and freedom. Let us enter into the song line of people in me. Let us enter into the song line that God is still living, healing, forgiving. Let us enter in. Let us enter into the place where our God has preceded. Let us enter into the place of the fear and the pain. Let us enter into the grace of the love when it's needed. Death is defeated. Let us enter in. Let us enter into the heart of a world that is broken. Let us enter into the start of a hope we can share. Let us enter into the heart where we call one another, sister and brother. Let us enter in. You may be seated. Now when God was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here for God has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as God lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for God has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As God lives and as you live yourself, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is God omnipotent, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. This ends the reading. A reading from Luke. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Rabbi, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? 
But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of God has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Rabbi, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Rabbi. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This ends the reading. I bid you grace and peace on behalf of 56 other brother, sister, sibling congregations within, with which you're in fellowship and community, mostly in Chicago, metropolitan area, as well as in Des Moines, Iowa. We give thanks, all of our churches, for your ministry here. And I can't tell you how excited the churches I know in Chicago are about your ministry, which in a sense they take a part in being your relations. And I want to urge you to be just as proud of the ministry they're doing on the south side of Chicago or with young people in Des Moines, Iowa, or in the suburbs struggling to understand new messages of justice they're receiving from many of our pulpits. I want to encourage you to, to understand that we are all together, that they are your siblings. Um, even as you are theirs. And it is in that spirit that I can only tell you how grateful I am to be here today worshiping again with you all. Please join me in prayer. Amen. I love what you've done with this place. <laughs> this is so cool. This is really, this is hipper than any loft apartment in Greenwich Village or Wicker Park in Chicago. This is awesome. I love, I love what you've done with this place. Seriously. I love what you have done with your understanding of your place, of your placement, of the place of your ministry. Your story is a sign of hope to so many of the other congregations in our region. One of our churches just sold its building and is renting back space in it, and now they have a freedom from financial worries that they haven't had for years. They're grateful for a story like yours that gave them hope and gave them heart. Or another church where the Euro congregation worshiping there owned the building and the Chin Burmese congregation rented, they just switched places. So now the Chin Burmese congregation owns the building and the Euro congregation is a space sharer. All kinds of stories like this. Your, your version is so creative and so interesting and I give such thanks for it. It's also difficult, I know. It's hard to think about selling a historic building. It's hard to think about moving to a new place. Churches get invested in their buildings and not just for bad reasons, but for good ones, too. They have, they have the feeling, the, the, the literal institution of legacy and history, of a place of ministry. The church to which I'm a member is about 25 years old. They've never owned a building. And in many moments of their history, that was a great blessing. Gave them freedom, has given them uh, just the ability to do things they couldn't do if they'd had a building to worry about. But it's also meant for them over the years a lot of instability, a lot of moving around, a lot of struggle to figure out things that churches with facilities just take for granted. I looked on your website this week to see what time the worship service started, just to double check, you know, when you're driving from Ann Arbor to Flint of a Sunday morning, you want to make sure you're not an hour late by accident. Because <laughs> in Chicago, all of my, you know, wristwatches are on the wrong time. And I saw the most interesting thing on your website. You said, sort of in an FAQ section, you said, hey, I heard you were closed. And your response to that was, 
You know, people confuse the church with the building. Far from it. We haven't closed at all, the website says. We're as busy as ever. We're growing. We're just in a different place, right size, in a building that is and will become iconic in its own way, your website says. An icon of a different kind of ministry in a different part of town where you're able to do a different kind of service. Your story is one of hope and of adventure, but I'm sure not without grief and not without a sense of displacement. And that's what I really want to talk about today, displacement. I realized as I was reading over and over again the, the Luke story, the gospel story for this morning, how central to the narrative of faith is the idea of displacement, certainly in our religious tradition. From the very beginning, what's the second thing that happens? Adam and Eve get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. They lose their place. Or the formative story of the Exodus, when the Israelites move voluntarily to Egypt because of a famine and end up staying there, end up in slavery, end up having to leave again in the middle of the night to get free the story of the Babylonian exile, where the Babylonian empire comes in and takes all of the best and the brightest of the Israelites away. Even the story of Joseph and of Mary, displaced to Bethlehem, displaced to Egypt after Jesus is born, this sense of homelessness, of, of displacement haunts, haunts our story. And spiritually, it has such relevance, I've realized, because it reminds us that in this broken and fallen world, safe space is only ever temporary, is only ever provisional, is only ever relative, relatively safe space. And too often, the spaces, even the ones we thought were safe, get shattered by an eruption of the wickedness of this present age. <clears throat> that Stonewall Inn was supposed to be a safe space and was most nights until that one night in June. Or the upstairs lounge in New Orleans. Or the Pulse nightclub. Supposed to be a safe space for young people to go and celebrate a new sense of who they were becoming. Was supposed to be safe. Mother Emanuel Church for a Bible study. For God's sake, it was supposed to be a safe space for the Parkland School. For that civil rights march in Charlotte, North Carolina. For that changing room at the Bergdorf Goodman store. Supposed to be a safe place. And more generally, this country we're founded to be a safe place for immigrants, for refugees, for people seeking asylum. We're supposed to be a safe place. Now, I'm not saying we need to be paranoid. We just need to be careful, and we need to not invest too much in our belief in the safety of things in this world. Most of us have spaces that are safe. And the greater our privilege, maybe that's a measure of what privilege really is, is the number of places where you can go and still be relatively safe. And much of our work, much of your work here, much of our work in Chicago, much of our work as followers of Jesus is to create safe space, but always remembering it can only be safer space. Always to create safer space. It's never 100%. We can always become displaced. We can always get space invaded. <clears throat> and our faith becomes part of the story of what happens next once you've been displaced. It's important and helpful, I think, to remember that Jesus' ministry was mostly itinerant, right? He went from place to place. He didn't have a home base. And that's what this story this morning is really about. It says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. The story starts with him already in the wrong place. And he turns toward Jerusalem. 
And he sent messengers ahead of him, it says. And on their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans and asked them to become ready for Jesus to enter. But they did not receive him because his face was set to Jerusalem. He was heading the wrong space. And it's always significant to notice when Samaritans show up in the Bible story. Always significant whenever Jesus interacts with Samaritans. You have to understand, Samaritans are not a different religion from Judaism. It's not like when he meets Syrophoenicians or Gentiles. The Samaritans are different. Samaritans are sort of a, a sect of Judaism. The comparison is more like Instead of imagining the relationship between, say, Christianity and Islam today, it's more like the relationship between Christianity and Mormonism. The Samaritans were sort of a, a, a strange, at least in the eyes of the, of, the, of the Orthodox Jews, a strange offset. And where they come from is during that Babylonian captivity, when the Babylonians took the best and the brightest to Babylon, the Samaritans grew up among the people who stayed behind. And they have their own scripture, a variation on the Torah, a variation on the Pentateuch. And they became very invested in place. You remember that story in John, where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman in the well. And she says, well, the difference between us is we worship God on this mountain while you worship God in Jerusalem. See? When Jesus is faced, they understand his face is turned to Jerusalem. They're understanding he's not our kind of guy. And remember Jesus' response. Jesus doesn't respond, you're right, I'm a Jerusalem guy, not a this mountain guy. No, Jesus says we're going to worship God in spirit and in truth. The space is not as important to him. He's an itinerant. So Jesus is already displaced, already on the road, and now he's dislodged again by this city that literally won't give him lodging. He's literally dislodged. And in that moment, Jesus offers one of his most heartbreaking teachings, one of the most daunting teachings we receive as his followers. He says, foxes have their holes, and the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man, and we can assume his followers, has nowhere to lay his head. Foxes have their holes. Birds have their nests. It's almost like he's undoing what he teaches even the sparrows God takes care of. What makes you think he won't take care of you even more? What makes you think she won't take care of you even more? It's almost like he's undoing that teaching. And I wonder if there's in Jesus' voice here even the little shadow of despair, how hard it is to be permanently displaced, how hard it is to be always on the road, how lonely Jesus must have felt among these unseeing generations, how homeless he always was. See, in that context, how important the ministry of creating space truly is. Jesus was honored except in his hometown. See how poignant that becomes? And he says to another, follow me. And that other says, Lord, first me, let me go and bury my father. And Jesus says to this man, let the dead bury the dead. I'm going. I have to go and proclaim the reign of God. And to another, he says, Come on. And that one says, I'll follow you, but just let me say goodbye to the people that are at home. And Jesus says, no, no, no. You're displaced too. Let's go. We have the work of the heavenly reign to do. Such a hard, poignant challenge that the life of faith will lead us sometimes into a place of displacement, will lead us away from safe space, safe harbor. And what are we going to do? How do we survive that? How do we take those steps on that journey? As I was thinking about it, I realized that maybe there's an answer suggested in the text from Elijah. And I want to tell you, I don't usually preach both texts. I usually pick one. But to me, today, they seem to relate to each other so 
nicely. And I have to also tell you, I almost always avoid preaching about Elijah at any cost, because I think Elijah is incredibly weird. <laughs> He's just, just a weird character, weird stories. He's kind of like the superhero of the Bible. Elijah's kind of like Iron Man. He's got magic clothes that make him super strong and impervious to attack, and he's got ray beams from his hands. Or maybe he's more like Batman, the Dark Knight of the Bible, because his story gets really dark and often, and he kills a lot of people. But in a strange way, this Elijah story seemed to me to be a kind of antidote to the haunting sense of displacement that Jesus names. The story of Elijah and Elisha, Batman and Robin, going together as Elijah prepares for his own final displacements. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven, it says, Elijah and Elisha went away, left their place, went away from the where they were, and Elijah said to Elisha, you wait here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel, further down the road. But Elisha says, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. You begin to hear the antidote to the problem of displacement. And it happens again, they will go as far as Bethel. And again, Elijah says to Elisha, stay here. For God has called me even beyond the Jordan. And again, Elisha responds, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. It reminds me of that other story of displacement, Naomi and Ruth. Naomi tries to send Ruth back home where she'll be safe. And Ruth says, No, where you go, I'll go. And where you stay, I'll stay. And whatever place you call home, I will call home with you. The antidote to displacement is going together. The antidote to displacement is community, is relationship, is not physical space, but is social, love, shared space of faith that we share with each other. When they'd cross the river through a miracle that Elijah does, Elijah asks Elisha, tell me what you want me to do for you before I'm taken away. What, what inheritance can I leave behind to you? And Elisha says, please give me double share of your, of your power. And Elijah says, well, you've asked for something hard, but if you stick with me to the end, it will be given to you. We have to part ways, but even then we can still walk together. Even then you won't be alone because my spirit remains with you. The togetherness we've shared will continue together. And so the chariots of fire come down and whirlwind Elijah up into heaven and Elisha is grief strucken and keeps looking and keeps calling after Elijah. And at the end he rends his own clothing tears off his own clothing and takes up Elijah's mantle and puts it on and finds that now he too has the power that his friend left for him. The antidote to displacement is community. The question of place is answered by people. Must we leave? Well, in faith, we must can't stay in one place. we got to get going. The kingdom of God is at hand, and we're part of building it up. We can't stay stuck. we got to move. But we can go together. You could tell the same story about what happened 50 years ago on Friday in New York City. The, the LGBTQ folks at Stone, at, at, this, at the, at the at the inn were displaced, kicked out, and they put on, like Elijah's man, mantle, some fabulous feather boas and took to the street together and created or gave new energy to the movement. 
You could tell the same story about those kids from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, displaced from their school, but into a community and doing things that might end up changing the world together. Or the women who've claimed me too, displaced even from their own bodies by the predations of others, displaced from their personal safety to create a new sense of community and a new sense of power in a togetherness that is both actual and virtual, both intensely local and global. And I will tell the same story about you, a Woodside Church of Flint, no longer quite beside the wood, displaced to a new place, but with a sense of community that, as near as I can tell, is at least as powerful as it was. I know for a fact that what has happened here is not adequately described as we used to worship there, but now we worship here. No. We used to worship now, but now look at us, worshiping in spirit and in truth together. And more profoundly, perhaps, than ever, worshiping together. Amen. Please join me in our statement of faith. We believe in God, the eternal spirit, who is made known to us in Jesus our brother and to whose deeds we testify. God calls the world into being, creates humankind in the divine image, and sets before us the ways of life and death. God seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. Judges all humanity and all nations by that wheel of righteousness declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord, God has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the whole creation to its creator. God bestows us upon the Holy Spirit creating and renewing the church of Jesus Christ, binding and covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. God calls us into the church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be service, servants in the service of the whole human family, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil. In Christ's baptism, Passion and victory. God promises to all who trust in the gospel forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, the presence of the Holy Spirit in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in that kingdom which has no end. Sin and honor, glory and power be unto God. Amen. Let us offer our collective prayers to God, saying, O oh God, giver of love, receive our prayer. O oh God, we praise the strength of your love, 
Where there is hunger, raise up your love. Where there is hurt and persecution, empower your love. God, give your love. Receive our prayer. Where nations are angry and plot harm against one another, bring your love. Where government does not seek the welfare of all its people, bring your love. Where power destroys what you have made, bring your love. Oh God, give your love. Receive our prayer. Where our fears keep us from offering aid to the needy peoples, bring your love. Where there is division and jealousy, bring your love. Oh God, give your love. Receive our prayer. O oh God, increase our affection, increase our compassion, increase our joy. Heal those who are sick, those who are known only to you, and those we name now. For Bill and Gloria, Dorothy, Lindy, Michelle and Andrew, Karen, Catherine, Evelyn, Linda, Kathy, Mark, Betty, Tyler and Lita, Doug, Earl, Cliff, Jason, Jean, Laura, Sandra, Dot, Alex, Jenny, Don and Liz, Harry, Greg, John, Melissa, John, Ashley, John, Jamie, Gabriel, Myron. Where there is pain, bring your love. Oh God, we give your love, receive our prayer. Oh God, we thank you for the power of divine love and for the presence of your love in one another. Make us holy, make us whole, and through us, bring healing to your world. Yes, in your most name. By our gifts and God's blessing, the world can be healed. Let us offer what we have. Let's stand and sing together. All that we have and all that we offer comes from a heart both bright and free. Take what we bring now and give what we need. All in God's name. All that we have and all that we offer comes from a heart both bright and then free. Take what we bring now and give what we need. All done in God's name. By these gifts and tithes, O oh God, we make our lives available for your purposes. In this bread and wine, we pledge the fruits of our labor for the sustenance of your people. Receive our gifts and open us with love. Amen. God be with you. And with you. Gathering 
give you thanks, O God, that you have once again fed us at this table of grace. Peace Peace